So Biblical Literacy Week 6, we are talking about uh, the tools that you use to read the Bible better. So this is just a little bit of add-ons that it comes to reading the Word. So if you want to look at the studies we've had on actually reading the Bible, that'll be in the first five lessons before, and you can find those all on YouTube. And so we're looking at tools to help with reading the Bible. And I got uh, one simple rule as far as whether or not a tool would make my list and that they all have to be very accessible, so they all have to be free, or they all got to be cheap. So I want things that are easy, accessible, because uh, if stuff's going to cost 100, 150 bucks, nobody's going to go out and get it. If it's hard to dig through to get the information, nobody's going to take the time for it. Like, take this for instance. This is uh, my favorite book set I have in my library, which is the 10-volume Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. It is one of the, I think, greatest tools that's ever been made to look up the history of a Greek word. I don't ever usually like the theological views of the author, but this dictionary, it takes every uh, Greek word that's in the dictionary. Actually, you'd think with 10 volumes, you could cover all the Greek words in the New Testament. There's a whole bunch they don't have. Uh, But every word that's in it, it has the meaning of the word in classical Greek, the meaning of the word in the Greek Old Testament, and then the meaning of the word in the Greek New Testament. So it's the only work where you can look up a word and see the occurrences of where it was used by the classical Greek authors uh, before it even got into Bible time. So the amount of information that it has there is just amazing. But the thing is, if you want to look up a word in your Bible and then get what the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament says about that word, it's going to take you a while to go through that process because you first have to figure out what the Greek word is behind that English word. Then you got to figure out if it's in that dictionary at all. And then you got to find it in that dictionary. And finding a single word in a 10-volume dictionary, not always the easiest thing to do. And then each reference for every word a lot of times is you're talking like three to ten pages. And so you got to go through all of that. And so it is such a headache. So when it comes to reading the Bible... Theological Dictionary of the New Testament is really no help at all, even though it is a fantastic reference. We want to talk about things that are actually helpful for Bible reading. And my first point when it comes to outside tools for Bible reading is that most tools do more harm than good. Most tools add more confusion than they add clarity. So for an example, uh, right off the bat, I'm just going to say beware and avoid all Bible and theological dictionaries. If you have a dictionary that says it's a Bible dictionary or a theological dictionary, it's probably not going to be helpful. Uh, They're not really dictionaries at all, but they are theological works masquerading as dictionaries. Uh, Like take this work, for instance. I was required to get the new Bible dictionary. When I started Bible college, uh, all students uh, were required to purchase this bad boy uh, with a sticker price of $45, but we got the discounted price for $30 for this guy. Uh, but we all had to uh, had to get this dictionary, and the interesting thing is, like, if you look up the words in here, you're not going to find dictionary definitions. You're going to find these biblical, theological definitions. So if you look up the word elect, it will give you this three-page theological diction- definition of the word elect from a Calvinist view of unconditional election. In other words, that election means that God sovereignly, which they use about 50 times in the midst of the definition of election, all incorrect for the definition of the word sovereign. Uh, But they talk about how God sovereignly chooses people in eternity past, uh, and then all those people who are chosen will inevitably become Christian, and that is what the meaning of the word elect is. The problem is, that's not what the word elect means. It doesn't mean anything about God choosing people irresistibly in eternity past, but if you look up the word elect in a non-theological dictionary, you'll get a proper definition, which is just simply election, a choice, the act of picking out or choosing. That's the meaning of the word elect. That's, that's it. It's not a big theological thing. And so what Bible dictionaries and theological dictionaries are is they don't show you the definition of a word. They show you the theological views of the author based on what they believe that word to mean. Sometimes it could be good. A lot of the times 
it's not good. There's a fallacy when it comes to reading where we take definitions of words that don't belong in that individual context and we wrongly apply them there because we've seen them somewhere else. So like if you have a word like, like set, uh, the word set is used in the context of setting the table and it's also used in the context of a tennis match. And so you don't say, hey, I'd like you to go set the table for me, honey. And then knowing that you're going to have dinner soon, and then you run out into the backyard and grab your tennis racket because obviously your wife's not talking about tennis. And so very often what theological dictionaries do is they give us this, this theological meaning of a word that, you know, it could be proper in one context, but there's no way it's proper in every context. And they make you think that the word always means that when it doesn't. A word finds its meaning based upon its basic dictionary definition and then the context surrounding it. And Bible dic dictionaries and theological dictionaries uh, take away that contextual meaning passages have, and they actually make the Bible more confusing instead of clarifying. So don't use Bible and theological dictionaries. We'll get to uh, how you should look up words uh, when we get toward the end. My suggested source for doing this. The next thing to avoid and not use is commentaries. Uh, reading commentaries, in my opinion, is only helpful if you can read a minimum of three opinions. And why is that? And that is because every commentary has places where they are wrong. We all make mistakes. We all say things that aren't true. We all forget passages that could relate to the passage at hand. Any commentator is fallible. For example, I was reading Alan Ross's commentary on Genesis this week. I've been reading it through in my study on Abraham. And most often, Alan Ross really hits things dead on. Uh, but one thing Alan Ross says talking about Abraham's prayer over Sodom is that Abraham's concern was that God would save the righteous or the elect in Sodom. But when you look at Abraham's word, I think you're kind of misreading the whole thing. Uh, I think Abraham was using the elect or the righteous as the shield for the entire city. Abraham wasn't looking to just save the righteous in Sodom. Abraham wanted to save the entire city of Sodom. And we might be like, why would Abraham want to save Sodom, well, we just remember a few chapters earlier in Abraham, in Abraham's life, what relationship did he have with the citizens of Sodom? They were kidnapped by Cheddar Laomer, and Abraham rescued them all and sent them back home. So it would make sense if God says, I got to destroy Sodom, that Abraham would be like, I just saved these people. Isn't there a way to save them? And if you look at his wording, it looks like Abraham is saying more, uh, I want to save the entire city and God. If you'll be merciful on behalf of, you know, 50, 45, 10, you know, be merciful to save the whole city. So I think Ross missed the point there on Abraham's goal, but all commentators make mistakes in what they say. Uh, I think we all have places where we go wrong, we go right. So if you're going to read commentaries, uh, you need at least to read three or four. But the bigger reason to avoid commentaries is not so much that they're wrong, but what is our goal in biblical literacy? It's reading the Bible. We want to read the Bible unfiltered. We don't want to read the Bible through the perspective of Alan Ross or Sean Wilson or any other commentator. We just want to read the Bible. So actually, when it comes to the very subject of biblical literacy, commentaries and biblical literacy don't mix. There's a place for commentaries in Bible study, but in Bible reading, the actual skill of Bible reading, what we want to do is be focused on reading the Bible itself. So this, this is all, biblical literacy is all about the idea of, I want to have the most unfiltered, pure view of the scriptures as possible. So I want to read the Bible and not what other people say about the scriptures itself. So what tools should we read for Bible reading? Uh, I would say the first tool that we should use is study Bibles and big asterisk on this when I say study Bibles. I'm highlighting one very small part of a good study Bible and not all of the notes that are throughout the Bible. So a very small percentage of the material that's brought to the table through study Bibles, and that is not the commentary notes throughout the text, but I'm talking about the introductions at the beginning of each book of the Bible. So that's the information you want in a good study Bible, the information material that is at the beginning of every book of the Bible. So that's that page before John or before Matthew or before Isaiah. When 
when you read a book of the Bible, especially one of those books of the Bible that you might not be that familiar with, like the Minor Prophets, or maybe some of those little epistles at the end of the New Testament where you're not sure the background and the timing, it's really helpful to be reminded who wrote this book, where this book fell in history, who are going to be the major characters that you're going to approach in this book. There's some characters that are pretty significant in Old Testament books, like the kings during Jeremiah's day, because that tells you when Jeremiah gave each prophecy. So it's a helpful to get a, a little reminder on who those main characters are and that background information. And so when we have a study Bible, we don't want to focus on all the notes throughout the, the Bible, because that's that commentary information that is very often distracting us. But the introductions on study Bibles, uh, to me, are the ideal length of introductions you want to have for Bible reading. So here's the three Bible studies that uh, study Bibles that I would recommend for their introductions. Uh, first, you have the New King James Version. Uh, the New King James Version. This was done by Nelson Publishers. Uh, Earl Rodmacher is the editor. Uh, one of the good things about having a study Bible edited by Earl Rodmacher is that he was the man behind the New King James Version itself. So it gives a lot of cohesion to uh, the Bible itself. They got uh, overall good notes, but their introductions they have are a pretty good length. They're usually about... Uh, two to three pages, more on the one and a half to two page length. And so the New King James Version, their uh, introductions. The next introductions, this is the longest of the introductions. His are usually about three pages long, but I like Charles Ryrie so much that I'm going to suggest the Ryrie Study Bible. Uh, but one of the things about Ryrie's introductions is that usually they're lengthy due to the uh, outline that he's going to put out of the book, which are usually longer than other outlines that you're going to have in study Bibles. But the information he's going to have on the author, uh, the location, the audience, the chronology, uh, all that's really good in the Ryrie Study Bible. So again, you're going to buy this $40, $50 study Bible to have this Bible to be the Bible that you're reading through each morning. And you can ignore, you know, 90, it's probably of being 98% of the notes as you're reading throughout the text. But whenever you come to a new book of the Bible, it's good to read that introduction before you start reading the book. And then the third study Bible I want to recommend is Tony Evans' study Bible. The reason being is that I think his introductions are just the, the perfect length. Uh, because they're one-page introductions. They give you that information that you'd want for an introduction in one page. It's an amount where you would say, I can easily read through this before I'm reading this book. I'm not going to feel overburdened to go through the introduction in there. So they're just really good. Uh, I like probably 90% of what Tony Evans puts out. He occasionally does stuff where I'm like, Bro, Tony, like why, why you got to say that? Uh, but I like, I like about 90% of what Tony Evans has. So for the most part, I think he's really good. But again, like I said, we're not, I'm not suggesting these for the notes throughout the chapter. What I'm suggesting these for is the introductions at the beginning. Now, you can buy books that are, they usually come Old Testament or New Testament, that are books that just have these introductions. Uh, the reason I don't suggest those books is that, for one, if you are get up in the morning to do your Bible reading, and let's say you're doing your Bible reading at, you know, 5.30 in the morning, and you're reading through, and you finish Leviticus, you're about to start Numbers, you're probably not going to get up from your chair, go over to your bookshelf, pull out your Old Testament introduction, pull open the Numbers, and then read a 10-page introduction on the book of Numbers. You're just not going to do that in real life. But if you're reading through the Tony Evans Study Bible, you come to the end of Leviticus, you're going into Numbers, it's just a one-page introduction to reorient you to what's in that next book of the Bible. And so I think it's really helpful. So I think you should get a good study Bible to read through, and what we're looking for is not so much the notes of each page, but the introductions for each book of the Bible. And so my recommendations are the New King James Study Bible, which is by Earl Rodmacher, the Ryrie Study Bible, which is by Charles Ryrie, and then the Tony Evans Study Bible, which is by Tony Evans. And I think all those will be helpful as you are being introduced to those books. Uh, so like I said, I don't know about you, but I'm just not going to get up and get a, a second introduction book. I want it already in my Bible right there. So that's tool number one, study Bible, because introductory material is just so important 
And it's just, it's, it's so crucial. So you want to have that uh, while you're reading through the Bible because it just gives some information that's not always necessarily in the text itself. Like we know specifically pretty much when the book of Jonah was written, but it's not based on material in the book of Jonah. It's from when Jonah's mentioned in the book of 2 Kings. And that tells us when Jonah lived and when his prophecy would have taken place. But you don't see that reading the book of Jonah. But a good introduction will say, based on 2 Kings 14, we know when Jonah was written, and then they can tell you about that background information. So that's what you're getting from those. All right, the second tool you want to use is Google. Uh, Nobody probably expected me to say Google for tool number two, specifically Google Image Search. Google Image Search, and what you're looking for is Bible Maps. So I think the most helpful things when it comes to reading our Bible with skill is that introductory material. We want to keep getting that refreshed over and over again. But the second thing that is so important is geography. Geography is everything, not everything, but it is so much in so many stories. Geography highlights so many points of the text and reveals and and discloses why certain things happen, why somebody went to this town as opposed to this town. The significance of somebody going to this city or that city matters so much based upon geography. And a good study Bible probably is still not going to have all the maps that you'd want to have. Looking at the maps in the back of your Bible isn't probably going to have all the maps that you want to have. But you know who's going to have all of the maps that you would ever want to have in the world? Google's got them all. All you need to do is search Abraham's life map, and you'll get 100 maps that show you where Abraham traveled in his life. Search David's life map, and you'll get a whole bunch of maps of all of the places where David went to in his his life. And sometimes the geography in David's life is... When he's running from Saul, those areas, it makes a huge difference if you know where he's going to in the nation of Israel based upon those maps. And Google's got them all there. They're just so easy to find. Just take, you could search based on the chapter that you're in in the Bible, search the character that you're at, and just search there in Google Images and they will all come up. Maps reveal a lot. Uh, Probably the one thing to keep in mind when looking at a Bible map for reference is that the nation of Israel is about the size of the state of New Jersey. So if you're looking at a reference for how do I know how far apart these things are, uh, Israel's the size of New Jersey. Uh, The other thing to remember is they didn't have automobiles. So even though Israel's the size of New Jersey, things are still a lot more far apart in their world than it would be in our world for the state of New Jersey. So so that sort of references you as far as space. But, But maps reveal a lot. Uh, I remember when I went through Genesis 14 uh, not too long ago here, and I talked about Cheddar Laomer's invasion of the promised land and his conquering of Sodom. My view of what happened in that, ch- in that chapter changed dramatically once I saw a map. And once I was able to just say, oh, they went here, they went here, and then they went way down here to the south. And then they go way back up before they ever get to Sodom. Like Cheddar Leomer goes all over the promised land before he ever gets to Sodom, even though Sodom was his prime location. So that tells you that there was a lot more going on here than Sodom. And if you know that uh, the other people groups that are mentioned in Uh, That chapter are also the people groups that are mentioned later in the Bible as the giants. Uh, Cheddar Laomer was actually trying to wipe out all the giant races before he got to Sodom to get the big fighters out of the way. And that's revealed in a large part by a map. It it changes everything. It also helps you to see how far Abraham had to travel to the north to track down Lot. And then another interesting point with a map is in Genesis 33. So if you're looking up a map with uh, the travels of Jacob and Esau, So Jacob and Esau meet up in Genesis chapter 33, that famous time where Jacob's sending all the gifts to his brother Esau, trying to placate them, and they come together and meet. And there's this real interesting thing where Esau's like, yo, bro, why don't you come and and travel with me? And Jacob's like, you know, like super coy, like, you know, like, yeah, I want to travel with you, man. But um, I I got these kids and these 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 calves and they're going to die if they go your speed. So I'm sorry, bro, I can't. And it seems like why is Jacob lying to Esau and refusing to travel with him? 
Well, the Bible tells us that Esau left from the land of Seir, and he's going back to the land of Seir. Well, if you look at the map, which I wish you could see these better, Bible maps don't ever look good on the PowerPoint screen because they're always uh, vertical instead of horizontal. But Seir is located in what end up becoming the nation of Edom, south of what will be the promised land. So Esau was actually going back away from the promised land. And so Jacob's like, bro, I don't want to go where you're going. I want to go to the promised land. That's the reason that Jacob acted the way he did. It's not that he's trying to deceive his brother. It's that Esau does, isn't living in the land of Abraham. Esau has already moved out, and Jacob doesn't want to move out of the promised land. And so that's why he's acting the way he does, and that's why he travels a totally different way. If you can see it in a map, it's like, no wonder he's acting that way. It makes complete sense. And a map reveals that basic information. And so, like I said, if you look up a map for that, you get it. And then we have maps. This is one where obviously you're not going to be able to read all this stuff. This is a basic map of when stuff happened during the ministry of Jesus Christ. And a lot of times being able to see Jesus going from one side of the sea lake to the other lake, you know, that, that plays into a lot of stuff. The things that happened in Judah in the south versus Galilee in the north, that has some significance. Too. And so these Jesus maps, uh, they can play a lot with the geography. I mean, if you just think of, you know, probably the most popular, uh, well-known information where geography matters is the meeting of the women at the well. And that is she's in Samaria. Normally they travel around Samaria when they go up to Galilee, but Jesus is going straight through it. And so knowing geography matters. So geography is so important for Bible reading. And one of the great things that we live in today is that we have access to thousands upon thousands of maps. Like I have, a, I have a software on my computer where I can edit maps in a really cool way and do lots of neat stuff with, with Bible maps in the area. And, you know, I go through that sometimes and I'll spend like, you know, an hour and a half crafting a map. And then I've had times where I've done that and then I've Googled and found the same map online in 30 seconds. And it's like... So I've stopped making maps because I can always inevitably find the map I need on Google. So they're all there. So geography is so important. So if you read somebody traveling from one city to another city, you could just take 30 seconds on your phone to Google somebody's journey and you might see where they traveled and you know your eyes might pop out because it might reveal a whole new piece of information about the text. And one of the things we need to remember is that when these books were written to the original audiences, they knew all this geography. They got all this stuff. This was just easy stuff for them to grasp. It's not that way for us. And so reading a map will really key it in when we see that Elijah travels uh, to where he goes to, I want to say, the town of Zarephath, where he goes to in the flood and um, with the drought. I feel like that's the wrong town. Wherever Elijah goes to when Israel's in a drought, he's going out of the land of Israel, which is a hugely important thing in the life of Elijah that he does that. And so those maps matter, and so they are important. You got them all over the place, so use those maps. The other thing that I would suggest is that when you're searching for maps, uh, the ones that you want to go by are the maps that are newer, uh, because archaeology is changing what we know about these locations all the time. Uh, I believe, as I presented before, I think that a location of Sodom was just discovered about 18 years ago. We didn't know where it was before then, but now we know where Sodom is. And sort of a, a kind of funny example, uh, illustration from my own time in Israel. Uh, when I was in Israel, uh, I went with Jews for Jesus, and so I wasn't in a travel group. So my time spent at the historical sites is just me all by myself. So I have no guide, nobody to tell me what to do. And so at one point, I'm, I'm walking through what's called the City of David Museum. So it's a museum that's just outside the old city walls of Jerusalem. And I'm just walking around the museum, you know, sort of just hoping I'm going to the right place. And then all of a sudden, I'm in this area where the, it's, it's so cool because there's all these old burial caves. And I'm walking around looking at these and I'm like, this is the neatest thing. And I'm looking for signs to explain stuff and I can't find them. And then after probably like 10 or 15 minutes, I'm like, it's weird that nobody else is around here because this just looks so cool. And so finally I'm like, well, I'm going to go back to where I started and see. So I'm going back to where I started. And as I'm walking out of this area, I noticed there's a smallish sign that I didn't see walking in there. And the sign was no entry. And then, it has, and then it has a little description of why. 
And the description of why was, was, I thought, the most interesting thing was that it talked about how they thought that at one time this was the burial location of the house of David. And so they used to take tours through there all the time, uh, but they ended up realizing that the burial house for David's descendants was in another spot of the city, and this wasn't it. And they had no idea who used these graves, uh, these caves. So they, they didn't allow people in there, it said, just because they don't keep up the paths anymore and maintain it. But, uh, but that's, that's an illustration to say at one time they were convinced this is where the descendants of David were buried. Now they know it was actually at this other spot because they found the better evidence for where the descendants of David was. But I was walking around having a grand old time. You know, I was like, oh, this is so cool, you know, just climbing up on stuff and uh, shouldn't have been there at all. But nobody caught me, so, uh, so I did all right. So use newer, uh, so all that says use newer maps because we are making new archaeological discoveries all the time. And so you want to be able to be up to date on the newest information. So I think you can find pretty easy based upon the, the dates of the maps and when they're used just by clicking on it and going to the website. But try to uh, use newer maps. And one of the good ways to find if they're newer is just if the image is a higher quality, that's usually a sign that it is a newer map based upon the quality of the map and the image. Oh yeah, and another good example is, is the Hittites. Up until I think maybe like the late 20th century. We didn't think the Hittites even existed as a people. Like scholars were like, this is one of the things we know isn't true about the Bible. There were no Hittites. It turns out the Hittites were this massive empire and we have Hittite language spread all throughout the ancient Near East in like 30 countries. We just didn't know that it was Hittite language until about 20 years ago. And now we know all these Hittite settlements that were all over the place. And again, showing that the Bible is right that the Hittites were traitors. We just could never translate their language until recently. And so we'd have that updated information about the Hittites with more recent maps as well. All right, and now the third and final tool. We might be done a little bit early tonight, uh, but that third tool that we want to take advantage of is stepbible.org. Stepbible.org. This is what I suggest using in place of Bible dictionaries and theological dictionaries. Uh, one of the things I like about stepbible.org is that it has a lot of Bible translations to use on the website or the app. My biggest complaint is that they don't have what I have deemed as the most important translation now, which is the New King James Version. Uh, but they have the King James Version, the Holman Christian Standard Bible, the 95 and the 2020 NESB, the ESV, the NIV, sadly not the 84 NIV, it's the newer version of the NIV, and also the very helpful, if you've never used it for Bible study, the Young's Literal translation. So it's got a whole bunch of translations in it. And what's great about stepbible.org is that they do what these books should do. And that is they give you an accurate definition of a word that is not theologically based. And so that's what we get in stepbible.org. And I just, the way they allow you to search for word meanings is, uh, it's, it's really neat. And hopefully you'll be able to see what I'm talking about up on the screen. So if you pull up your step Bible, uh, what you can do is search by, um, by verse, chapter, verse, so forth. You can read right off of it. Uh, my encouragement for you is not to do your primary reading in step Bible, but to use it if you want to look up the meaning of a word. And what I have in the red there is uh, outlining the little magnifying glass, which is what you use to look up a word in the step Bible. And so you click on that little magnifying glass. It gives you a pop-up to search for a word. And because I can't read that, I'm going to need to turn and look here. Okay, so my example is you search for the word love. And when you search for the word love in there, what it's going to give you is multiple options to do. Uh, one is you can just click on the top love out of the highlighted options there, and it'll just show you all the occurrences of love in that Bible that you're using. Or the cool thing that it does, and this is the cool thing that it does, is that if you go two-thirds down, it shows you the different Greek words that are translated as love in the New Testament, and then you can search for all the Greek occurrences of that word. So you got love, and you can just click on the love in the Greek for agape, and it'll give you all the uses of where agape is there and then translated as love. So like, for instance, agape sometimes in the King James Version is translated as charity and not as love. But if you search based on the agape, you'll get all of the Greek occurrences of love 
even if it is translated by a different word in that English translation. So it's a legitimate way to, tra to search a word in there. And then the, at the bottom, it gives you the Hebrew uses. And so there's actually two different Hebrew words for love in the Old Testament. There's chesed and have. And so you can choose to search either one of those uh, words in the Hebrew Old Testament. So again, if you're searching love in the Hebrew Old Testament, in the Old Testament, you're going to be getting one of maybe two different Hebrew words. You won't be getting all of the occurrences of either one of those words. So this is better word searching uh, if you're looking in the step Bible. And it allows you to search in the Greek, search in the Hebrew when you don't even know any Greek and you don't even know any Hebrew. So it's just, it, it's, it's, it's so cool. Okay, second is that if you are reading in your Bible and you come to a word and you're like, I don't know the meaning of that word, and you pull up that verse in the step Bible, so the example verse I used was 1 John 2.2 because it has the word propitiation in it, and how often do we come upon the word propitiation in the Bible? Enough so most people have no idea what it means, even if it's explained every time they've seen it before. So if you pull up propitiation, uh, if you pull up 1 John 2.2 2 in your step Bible, and if you have it on a PC, you just hover your mouse over that word, or if you press on it, if you're using your cell phone, so just pull it up in your phone, press on the word, and what will happen is the blue bar on the bottom is the definition of that word. The... Make sure I get my right and left. The right side gives you the word analysis of this word. And what's great is that I think as much as you can be, this analysis and this definition is just simply based upon the meaning of that word without a theological meaning imposed upon that word. So for instance, the word propitiation means atoning sacrifice or the means of forgiveness. Therefore, in 1 John 2, 2, what is John saying? He's saying Jesus is the atoning sacrifice. He's the sac sacrifice that atoned for our sins and not only ours, but for the sins of the entire world. Now, just because Jesus atoned for all the world's sins doesn't mean that they're saved, but what it does mean is that they are savable, that Jesus has done the work to uh, break the barrier between them and God, so now they can believe in Jesus Christ for salvation. Actually, propitiation, sort of a great picture that's been put out, you know, probably a thousand times in church history, is that picture of the great gulf between man and God, and then the cross is covering that gulf. That cross is propitiation. That is the atoning sacrifice. Jesus has made the way. Faith is when we walk across a cross and then we believe in Jesus for salvation. So if you want to think of propitiation, it's, it's that picture is the cross being that atoning sacrifice for us. And again, there's ideas that people put into propitiation that may or may not be right about God um, being appeased by wrath. And so God pouring his wrath on Christ and taking the wrath that we deserve. Sometimes I think that that's right. Sometimes I don't think that that's right. I think it might be adding meaning into the word. But based on some other things, I think it, it could be right. I'm just not positive. But they don't add that meaning in there because it's not actually in the dictionary definition of the word. And so I think they do a really good job in the dictionaries that they use. I don't know what dictionaries they use for Step Bible. I tried to find out which one it was, but I couldn't when I was looking up for it. But in all the words that I looked up for a sample, uh, they give you just the straight up meaning of the word. So if you come to a word in your Bible and you're like, I don't know what this word means, and you don't want a theological flavored version of this word of somebody saying, you know, here based on my construct of theology, theology, this is what it means, just a basic meaning. Stepbible.org does a great job at just giving you uh, the basic information. And it's free, and you can watch, get it on your phone. You can, you know, you just go to stepbible.org, you can have it on your computer. So you come to a word in your Bible that you just don't know what the word means. You know, if you have the Step Bible bookmarked or home screen, you can just click on it really quick, go to that chapter and verse, look up the word. They will show you what the word means. And the great thing about their dictionaries is, I don't know if you can see it, but they're, I'm sorry, this isn't bigger, but they're not giving you the definition of propitiation. They're give, of the English word, they're giving you the definition of the Greek word that it's based on. So if it was in the Old Testament, they'd give you the definition of that Hebrew word that it's based on. So it's just... 
when I, when I, yeah, when I first came, when somebody first suggested Step Bible, I'm always like kind of iffy with the free Bible software, but I started to look at this one. I was like, this does some, some neat stuff, some stuff that if you wanted to buy Bible software that did this, you'd probably have to spend a couple hundred dollars, but it's just, it's there for you free online to look up this information. So, uh, then, then this brings us to my next point is that you might be tempted to say, let me just do my Bible reading on my phone, on my computer. And my next suggestion is read the Bible from a paper Bible. Don't read the Bible on your phone or on a computer. I am learning about this problem uh, firsthand right now. I am trying to read through the new legacy standard Bible. I'm most of the way through it at this point. I've read through uh, all of it except for the prophets in the Old Testament. I read the New Testament first. And uh, so, uh, and I couldn't get a print copy when I was reading Legacy Standard Bible. It's brand new, not available on print. Well, it is available on print, but it's hard to get. I tried to get the publishers to help me out to get a copy, and they weren't really any help. So I've been reading it on my phone. And one thing I've discovered reading on my phone is that most of us are not disciplined enough to read the Bible on our phone. Because what happens if you're reading the Bible on your phone? Ding, you got an email. Ding, you got a notification about social media. Or you're reading your Bible and you think, oh, man, your mind wanders for a second. I wonder what the weather's going to be like today. And then all of a sudden, you were reading your Bible, and then the next second, you're on AccuWeather, and it's like, what was I even doing? Uh, We are just not disciplined enough to read our Bible on electronic devices. Uh, It is really hard to read the Bible on the phone. It is much superior uh, to read the Bible on paper. Uh, I've been reading the Bible for the last probably 10 years on my Kindle, and I think I'm at the point now after reading on my phone for eight months to be like, I'm done with electronic Bible reading. I'm only reading paper Bibles for the rest of my life for the Bible reading. Because not only do you want to read from the Bible to avoid outside distractions, but also we retain information better when we write things down. So make notes. I'll make notes while you're reading your Bible. You can make it on a journal, separate sheet of paper. Uh, Personally, I prefer to just write in my Bible. Uh, Just write in the note space there. If I see something that's significant in one paragraph that I think ties down and I notice it, you know, two paragraphs later, something similar, I'll draw a line from one to the other and write down stuff about it. Uh, Study after study has proved that if you write while you're reading, that it helps you retain information better. It helps you make sense of information better. So if you really want to grow in your understanding of your Bible, read a paper Bible and be willing to write in that paper Bible. Um, so my, I, think, I think everybody should have a collection of Bibles in different translations. Maybe have get all three of those study Bibles. I mean, we're all at a point financially, you can, you can drop $50 a year on a new study Bible to get those different introductions to read through and just, just go through each one, reading a different translation, uh, writing down notes each time. And then I think it's cool if I go back to reading a Bible again and I made notes and I get to see those previous notes that I made on a passage, ways that I tied those things together, I think that helps things stick with me even more. So use a paper Bible, uh, make notes in it while you're reading. I just For me, that I think is just such a key piece of information. And I got to say, after spending some time reading my Bible on my cell phone, I will never again read my Bible on my cell phone. I do not like it. And so uh, big suggestion not to do that. Uh, we went and visited uh, Beth Webb's church uh, in San Antonio when we were uh, when we left for the for the hurricane. Yeah, we went and visited her church, and I like her pastor uh, in the San Antonio area a lot. So I was excited to go and hear him hear him uh, preach at her church. I think she's got a great guy that she's got as a pastor there. And one of the points he made in his sermon was about uh, reading on paper Bibles, and I just kind of was like. Ah you know, it's probably not all that important. But after spending some time reading on myself, and I'm like, oh, he knew what he was talking about. Uh, that's a good note. So, uh, so read on paper Bibles. Uh, but we always need to remember the words that Joshua said to Israel as they were entering the promised land. Uh, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. And I think one of the things that kind of astounds me about Joshua 1.8 is that he's talking about the importance of meditating on the Bible day and night, being in the Word. And when Joshua wrote that, they had 
Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They probably had a handful of copies of it too amongst the entire nation. They probably didn't have copies for all of the people. They, there's no way they had copies for everybody in the community throughout that point. And Joshua was still making that point, meditate on this. And, and what a gift that we have today. That not only do we have that book of the law that Joshua was talking about, but we have Joshua's writings. We have all of that history of God's people with, with Judges, with Ruth, with First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings. We have the songbook of the Jews. We have fulfilled prophecy after fulfilled prophecy after fulfilled prophecy. We have the chronicles of the life of Jesus Christ. We have the gospel. What we have And this is in no way to minimize the first five books of the Bible. I love me some Genesis. What we have, though, today is so vastly superior to what Joshua was telling Israel about. Because we got Jesus in the Gospels. They didn't have that. And if Joshua was saying to them, meditate on this law day and night, we should be people who are meditating on the Word of God day and night. This should be our heartbeat. This should be our drive. And I don't want us to be people who our Bible reading is devotional books that are written 90% by other authors, and we have a verse that they're talking about at the beginning of the chapter and a few verses sprinkled in throughout. I want us to be people of the book, people who are reading straight Bible, Uh, One of the things that I love about that my kids have done is that, you know, they've sat down and just read the Bible. Like, and that's, you know, that's what you want. And that's what I want for us in the church is to be people who just read the Bible. And my whole goal with this final section of tools to help you read is that I legitimately want them to be tools to help you read the Bible. I don't want them to be aids so that they will interpret the Bible for you, aids that will replace the Bible. I want them to be helps that will come alongside them while you're reading the biblical text. And so I think the only thing that things that really do that well are introductions to books of the Bible, maps that show us that all-important geography at some times, and then also a basic dictionary that will tell us the meaning of words that We don't know what they mean, or what I love about Step Bible is that it tells us the dictionary definition of the Greek word or of the Hebrew word that sometimes is a little bit different than the English word that we have there. And so I think that that is probably all the tools that we need, but I think those are really helpful tools so that we can read and understand the Bible better. So I thank you for spending these six weeks in biblical literacy, and I hope that at the end of this, we'll all read the Bible better.